Thanks, everyone. Thanks for making the trip out tonight. Um, so I am going to talk to you a little bit about climate adaptation. But before I start, just a show of hands, how many of you in your home, in your life, are undertaking efforts to reduce your energy consumption? Not surprising. How many of you are taking efforts to prepare for extreme weather and climate change? That's, that is more surprising. That's great. I'm going to talk to you a today a bit more about what we can do to prepare for climate change, the impacts that we're experiencing. Now, Ann Arbor has a long history of both mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and preparing for climate change. But when I talk about climate adaptation, I just want to put up a little definition here for you. It really is about making sure that we are prepared for any adjustments that may happen short term in weather or long term in climate. And that's about making sure we seize on opportunities that may exist in a changing climate. We don't often talk about that, but there are some opportunities. Uh, it could be a longer growing season, hard to imagine today, but it's possible. Uh, it could be longer tourist uh, seasons and more opportunities to bring in economic revenue. But there are a lot of negative ramifications of climate change too. So adaptation is making sure that we're being proactive, thinking about projected and existing changes and preparing society for those changes. What we really need to have and what the city of Ann Arbor is thinking about is a dual approach. And this is um, a tagline from a report that came out from the United Nations that uh, a mentor of mine helped work on, which is what we really have to do and how I think about this issue is we've got to make sure that we are doing everything possible to avoid the unmanageable. So we need to mitigate to the extent that we can. But we also have to acknowledge that there are some things that we have to manage. So we need to avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. So that's kind of the tag line of what I think about when I think about preparedness. How many of you have actually read the city's climate action plan? It's a good read. Get in there. It's graphically pleasing. It's lovely. Um, when you take a look at that, you're going to be overwhelmed with the number of mitigation activities or activities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The city also acknowledged the need to prepare. Um, this is not as robust of a section, but a lot of us are working on building this out. And this is because it's a relatively new field if you look broadly at what cities are doing to prepare for climate change. So there are five strategies, and I list them here. Uh, slides will be made available so you can take a look, or you could just go to the plan directly. Um, but there's a different degree here. The strategies that we see in Ann Arbor's plan tend to be at a higher level, like um, protect our citizens. Good goal. What we have to do now is figure out how we do that, right? So we're all working to kind of actualize these strategies, bring them down a level, and figure out how do you operationalize these components. But broadly, these are the things we've agreed upon as a community. What I want to do now is step outside of Ann Arbor, and I'm going to take you on a tour nationally of what cities are doing to prepare for climate change. Um, my background is working with cities. I moved to Ann Arbor about 18 months ago. Delighted to be here. Enjoyed the first year a little bit more weather-wise. But you know, it's all right. It's a journey. Um, so I, I'm going to take some experience working with cities. There are literally hundreds of examples that I could share with you about what's happening around the country. But let's not belabor it. Let's jump in. Broadly, um, this is a planning process. It's probably very similar to anyone who's ever done any planning or thinks about how you plan in your, your home, you plan at a city scale, you plan at a national level. Um, generally, throughout this process, the first three are where cities are. They're identifying the risks and the vulnerabilities from extreme weather and climate change. Um, many are starting to plan or think about the different options that they could implement to address those risks that they're facing. Um, less are implementing, but we are starting to see a ramp up of the number of communities actually doing things on the ground, changing policies, putting in infrastructure, building social capital, lots of different strategies. Where we don't have a lot of work is in the last two phases of a good planning process. That's monitoring and evaluating what we've actually done on the ground, and then of course revising um, being very iterative, going back to this process, uh, sharing our lessons learned with our peers. So we're starting to see communities move through this process, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know on the ground. So let's go to our neighbor to start. Chicago, Illinois, uh, leads the nation really in green roofs. They have, well, they're one of the top in terms of total square footage of green roofs in the community. A little fun anecdote, I'm going to do what I'm not supposed to do, and I'm going to walk. This is Chicago City Hall. This is a state building. You can see on the far side, there's no green roof. On the city side, there is a green roof. Uh, on a very hot day, they went out to the roofs and uh, measured temperature. Temperature on the green roof side was in the 90s. Temperature on the non-green roof side was uh, around 150 degrees. Massive amounts of cooling coming from green roofs. Uh, so Chicago's certainly been leading a national charge in this area. And they've also been doing some really fascinating work around green alleys. 
Um, if you spent some time in Chicago, you know there are a lot of alleyways. It's kind of where neighborhoods are based. A lot of them are vacant. They've been using those alleys, kind of tearing up the existing infrastructure and putting in pervious pavement so that water will absorb. So it's a stormwater management feature. But they got a side benefit. When they did that, they made those alleys much more inviting. And neighbors started to come out into the streets. And they started to talk to each other. And they started to have neighborhood block parties. And they created a living space. And so they're scaling up their green alley program. So not only are they managing stormwater, they're building this critical thing called social capital, which is really important as we think about adaptation. Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Boulder, Boulder is one of 33 cities that were just selected by the Rockefeller Foundation in their 100 Resilient Cities program um, to help massively scale up resilience efforts. Uh, Boulder has been pretty hammered in the last few years. Not only did they have a massive drought, they then followed that up with a wildfire and then extreme flooding. Um, so Boulder is really thinking about how to move forward. They have for a long time been focusing on water which makes a lot of sense. So if you look at Boulder's strategies, there's a lot around water conservation that they've been doing. But what I think is really important, when we talk about resilience, which is a core part of adaptation, we often think about this idea of bouncing back. But you can imagine that there are people who don't want to bounce back to where they are now. If you're poor or if you're struggling, why would you want to come back? So it's not about bouncing back, it's about bouncing forward. And that's what Boulder is trying to do through a community effort, is vision what the future could be when they're more resilient to all kinds of impacts and stresses. Heading down to Dubuque, Iowa. Dubuque also faced some pretty extreme flooding recently. In order to address this, they've been doing some work um, around building a new wastewater treatment facility to manage the capacity that's coming in. And they're following Chicago's footprint and starting a massive green alley program to try to manage on stormwater on site throughout the city. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a house in the background. Uh, there's about five feet of standing water. I'm trying to give you a lot of different impacts that communities are facing. So we talked a little bit about flooding. We've talked a little bit about heat. Drought is certainly an issue. Um, California is just coming out of the most extreme drought that the, the state has ever faced. This is a reality. Um, we're pretty water rich here. One of the things uh, that we want to think about, though, is because we're water rich, are we going to have an influx of people? from water poor regions, and can our infrastructure handle that? Do we have the facilities and the capacity to deal that, with that influx of additional people and additional needs on our social systems? Um, so El Paso, just as an example here, obviously they have extreme heat, they face drought repeatedly, um, and so they're doing a lot of work on water conservation, reaching out into the community, using trusted advisors, um, using the religious networks that they have to actually get in homes and help people um, reduce water consumption broadly and water costs, um, because it does cost for water. Lewis, Delaware is a very small community of about 2,000. They were the first community in the nation to work with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to integrate climate change into their hazard mitigation planning process. This is really, really important um, because we talk a lot in the adaptation field about having no silver bullet. In the climate mitigation field, there's a very clear silver bullet. It's called energy efficiency. No matter where you are, it is always smart to be as efficient as possible. Then you can talk about renewable energy, and then you talk about other strategies. But climate impacts are local. Not every community faces the same threats. And so there's not one strategy that you can tell everyone to do. The closest strategy we have is this. Integrate climate change into your hazard planning. Why this is really important is, and apologies if anyone knows this, but hazard mitigation planning comes from FEMA, which was uh, mandated to do this through the Stafford Act, which was a, congressional, uh, a congressionally approved act. And it requires that you plan for hazards based on historic hazards that you've experienced. But climate change is changing history, literally. And so if you're preparing for a previous hazard, you're probably not prepared for a future hazard that's gonna be more intense, more frequent, or possibly more severe of longer duration. So we have all of these communities, there are about 22,000 communities that have hazard mitigation plans but those plans don't have climate change in them. So Lewis was a pilot for FEMA to figure out how you integrate climate change into that process. This is significant. Um, so there's been some work to replicate this in other parts of the country. Um, Biloxi, Mississippi gets a, a little shout out here for a lot of the work they've been doing around disasters. Um, the Gulf Coast is the most disastrous part of our country, if you look at the number of total disaster declarations that we face. 
Um, and so they are similarly looking at how to integrate climate change into their hazard mitigation uh, process. But they've been doing some really important outreach to stakeholders because there's a high transition of people. So people come in and don't know how to prepare for disasters because they've never experienced them before. So there's a lot of outreach going through the real estate agencies, uh, through neighborhood associations to teach people about the vulnerabilities that they face. Um, Seattle, I'm going to cue this up because Susan, I think, is going to talk to us a bit about Ann Arbor and how we can do something similar to this. Seattle gets national attention for their neighborhood work. They have a Department of Neighborhoods, and the entire intent there is to revitalize or reinvigorate all of the neighborhoods so that people know each other. That if a disaster were to hit, you don't call the city, you go to your neighbor. You actually build social capital. Um, it took my husband and I, probably three months before we really knew one of our neighbors when we moved to Ann Arbor. That's, that's not great news, folks. So the idea is how do we build social capital and make our community stronger throughout the board? I am almost out of time. Well, I am out of time. So I'm just going to pause here for a second. Um, we've got urban food. Great work happening. Um, we've got collaboration across jurisdictional boundaries. Climate impacts don't start and stop in Ann Arbor. They cross borders. So we have to find ways to work with our surrounding communities, the region broadly, to really prepare. Um, and we've got some models of this happening, and we're following these really closely. Um, but in conclusion, really what we know, climate action is happening at the local level. It makes sense. Impacts are at the local level. Our actors are small, medium, and large. They're all size of cities, townships, villages, boroughs. It's everything you can imagine. They're geographically diverse. They're somewhat politically diverse. Uh, there is a tilt here that you could imagine. They're often driven by more than just climate change. It's driven by the economy. It's driven um, by su sustainability goals or agendas that exist. There are a lot of different motivators. Um, most of these places are economically challenged, and they're struggling with how to implement strategies, but they're finding this as a mechanism to bring in people and bring in business. We're not doing as much as we need to. We need to scale up, and we need your help to figure out how we can do that here in Ann Arbor. But ultimately, cities are centers for innovation, experimentation, and solution setting. And together, we're going to figure out how to do that. So thank you.